Welcome to Triple Treat Book Chat, the podcast that delves into the captivating world of contemporary literature. I'm Tamar Jrenti, a Georgian poet and a host of this podcast. And joining me today is our esteemed guest, Martina Nichols, an Australian writer and not only an accomplished author, but also an international consultant specializing in human rights-based education, healing and well-being, peace and civilization initiatives, as well as foreign aid audits and evaluations. In each episode of Triple Treat Book Chat, Martina Nichols and I will embark on a literary journey centered around a particular theme. Within this creative space, we will explore the literary works of three contemporary authors. This is our second podcast in this series with the theme Father and Son. There are many father and son novels that come to mind, such as the 1996 book Patrimony by Philip Roth and even Barack Obama's 1995 memoir Dreams from My Father. But today we are featuring a Swedish author, a French author, and a Nigerian author. In today's discussion, we'll delve into the question that lies at the heart of father and son relationships, from conflict to competition, and from acceptance to rejection. I turn to Miss Martina with our opening query. What is it about the father and son narrative that beckons, and why do these narratives hold such intrigue for you? Thanks, Tamar. It's good to be back with episode two of the Triple Treat Book Chat. As you pointed out in the introduction, there's often a certain type of tension between fathers and sons, and that tension and any resolution makes good reading, I think, as well as introspection as readers think about their own relationships with their own fathers, coupled with other um, potential feelings such as love, companionship, hate, shame, envy, adulation, emulation, disappointment and regret, I think novels can evoke strong emotions with the theme Father and Son. The uh, collection of three novels today reflect the lives of fathers and sons across different cultures, uh, but with uh, common themes. Uh, Well, the first book today is by Swedish author Patrick Svensson, written in 2019 called The Gospel of the Eels. Patrick Svensson, born in 1972, is also a journalist. The Gospel of the Eels is, the, is his first book. And technically, Miss Martina, this is a non-fiction story, right? So I'm very interested in your rationale for including this book in our podcast today. As far as I know, this is an extremely detailed history of the eel in the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, it's true that the novel is is nonfiction. Um, it's about the life of the enigmatic aquatic creature, the eel, but it's also an autobiographical story about the author and his father, and that's why I've included it. The first edition by Albert Bonnier's Press is called The Eel Gospel, The Story of the World's Most Enigmatic Fish, but the 2020 Picador version is called The Gospel of the Eels, a father, a son, and the world's most enigmatic fish, which I think is a more appropriate title. Although I would have just called the book Fishing for Eels with my dad. So this is a story of a father and son doing what they love and spending quality time together. The novel follows the lifestyle of the eel from its birthplace in the Sagasso Sea, Um, its migration migration route, its fascinating long life, and its way back to its breeding ground. But the author begins and ends with his father, father and son eel fishing. The eel lives a, a tranquil life, except when it begins looking for a mate from the age of 15 to 30 years. But as the author writes, no human has ever seen eels reproduce. No one has seen an eel fertilise the egg of another eel. No one has managed to breed European eels in captivity. He adds how deeply some truths are hidden. An eel becomes what it needs to be when the time is right. He equates this with his own life, being able to become whoever he needed to be when the time was right. 
The writing shows such a close positive bond between father and son during their early morning time together fishing for eels. This is an easy to read book on the mysterious strange eel. It's, it is scientific, that's true, but it's also a, um, a memoir of a shared passion, well written and beautifully evocative. Patrick Svensson reveals so much about the wriggling, slimy fish that it becomes almost as lovable as the clownfish in the 2003 animated movie Finding Nemo. No. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought that a fish could be loved so much. Uh, thank you for the review. Now, could you please read a short excerpt from the Gospel of the Eels so that the audience has a chance to become familiar with the author's language? Yes, I will. It's um, so beautifully written and the book starts with a poem and you know I like a poem. Significantly, it starts with a few lines from the poem called Loch Ni um, Sequence in the 1969 collection title Door Into the Dark by the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney. Um, I'll begin the uh, exit. Later in the same fields, he stood at night when eels moved through the grass like hatched fears. The eel feeds in the dark and the dark feeds the fears of the unknown. The eel is simultaneously strange and recognisable. There is a sense of conflict, pitting the human in the half-light of the morning with the eel at home in the murky, dark waters, the furling, slippery hall, a knot of black and pewter belly. Migrating eels, even for an adult, are hatched fears, which are the monstrous ropes, lice, worms or eels which will drag the child down, out of his own element and into the water to drown. Wow. Uh, fears seem to be expressed by the author when he was a young boy, eeling with his father, juxtaposed the strength and protection of his experienced father. So do you think that the book also explores the extent to which the son may want to over overcome the protection of his father and become uh, more independent, maybe? Oh, that's an interesting observation. The life cycle and the migration of the eel over a long distance could be representative of the young boy moving away from home, travelling on his own, transitioning from immaturity to maturity and the development of his uh, independence. Thank you. Uh, so the second book today is the 2009 book by French author Richard Morgier called Horse. In French, the title is Cheval. Richard Morgave from Paris was born in 1950. He was orphaned as a teenager when his mother died of cancer when he was seven years old and his father died by his own hand when Richard was 13. So Richard took to reading as a means of consoling himself. Yes, Richard Mongrie's uh, 2009 novel Horse is fictional and is set in the 1960s in Paris. The novel pivots around a fairground and a rundown family home in Paris. Father and son work together managing a fairground ride, a carousel, uh, which is more commonly called a merry-go-round. The carousel has belonged to his family since 1897. The horses on the carousel are called the flying saucers and they spin children around while their parents look at them from the outer edge. The father and son are from Algeria, without a wife, without a mother. The boy's mother died when he was eight years old. They have each other, and they must care for the safety of the children riding the carousel. They are seen, though, by society as the dregs of life, as they live on the verge of poverty. The boy is the narrator of the story, writing about his life from the age of 12 to 18 years old. Women rarely feature in this story. Story, and when they do, they are not depicted well, for neither father nor son felt love nor affection from anyone except each other. Father and son share the same name, they share the same job, the same home, the same lifestyle. They argue, they fight, they get on, they don't, but they are always together. When one is sad, they are both sad. 
When one is frustrated, they are both frustrated. The novel explores the close father and son relationship. Their relationship is not always civil or polite. In fact, it's mostly coarse and vulgar. But they are together more than twins. They are so inseparable that they are like one single person. During the novel, they try to determine who they really are as single entities. Very interesting. So far, we have two books about strong father and son bonds. Again, would you like, uh, would you kindly share a brief passage from Horse, please? I'll read from the early section of the novel when they um when they go to the cinema to watch um, a movie great the room is full of people it's the saturday western at the cinema i've seen it so much that it makes me nervous i don't really look at the screen dad does with his hat on his nose he gallops along the dili- along with diligence waiting for the worst the settling of scores over over there in Dodge City or in Tombstone. I don't know. Either way, it's in Hollywood. Just a bad time to have in a life of bad times. I look down at my Levi's. They can't be seen well in the dark. I can't bring myself to wash them. I feel a tingle in the back of my neck and I turn around. Priscilla watches me while she blows a bubble with her chewing gum. Priscilla's bubble is bursting. On the big screen, the owner of the gold mine appears treacherous at the window with his rifle. Dad and I pretend that we are in the movie. Dad shoots first, using his fingers as a gun, with me right behind at the same time as Big John on the screen. The owner of the mine topples over. We laugh loudly. As usual, people in the cinema complain. They say, oh, stop shooting at the screen. Oh, but it's okay. It's over, right? (laughs) <laughs> Very cinematic passage indeed. Uh, moving on, uh, I'd like to briefly turn to classic literature now. Could you please tell us which father-son duo stands out for you and why from classic literature? Um, I love the African-American classic 1953 novel Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin. It's semi-biographical and incredibly powerful. A 14-year-old boy called John Grimes is coming to terms with his identity as he comes of age. His stepfather is the minister of the local Pentecostal church in Harlem in 1935. It's a very complex, ambiguous, personal, introspective um, exploration of religion and moral sexuality and race embedded in the narrative. The strong characters are neither good nor bad, and both son and father have their faults. Interestingly, along with it being a coming-of-age novel, it is about a long, dark journey, but written very beautifully. Um, I love the story very much. It's extremely touching and impressive. And now uh, we turn to our final book. The third book today is the 19... 58 book Things Fall Apart by Nigerian author Chinua Achebe. He was born in 1930 and died in Boston, America in 2013 at the age of 82. Things Fall Apart was his first novel, which is often on school reading lists. He was critical of how Western literature depicted Africa and set about to write African literature. The novel itself is set on a Yam Farm, a sweet potato farm owned by Okonkwo, struggling to pay off the debts of his father. Thanks, Tema. Chinua Achebe is, of course, well known and well read, with his book considered to be the first modern African novel. Okonkwo, the character, has three wives and ten children, and he's a strong leader in his community, a great warrior and a wrestling champion. He wants to clear his father's debts and gain back the family's good reputation. His obsession with his own masculinity and how he defines being a man results in his aggression towards his family and his community. The village elders select him to be Ikamofuna's guardian, living with the Kwonko's family. The 
he's so he's not Ikemu uh, Fumo is not part of the family. He's an orphan boy. The boy loves him like a father, and Okronko loves him like a son, but he does not show it because he thinks it will be seen as a weakness. The village fortune teller says that the boy must be killed, and after Okronko administers the final death blow, he feels guilty and devastated, a tortured soul. Then his world falls apart with the arrival of European colonizers and Christian missionaries. Even in exile, he cannot feel at ease with his shame. He has killed a child that he loved so much, more loved that, than any of his own blood-related sons. He will be forever tortured. Then he commits the ultimate act, going against his own community's beliefs so that he can be free of his own hell. And it's time to read from the uh, from things all apart, please. Here is um, an excerpt describing the deaths of Okwanko's father, Yunoka. When Yunoka died, he had taken no title at all and he was heavily in debt. Any wonder then that his son, Okwanko, was ashamed of him. Fortunately, among these people, a man was judged according to his worth and not according to the worth of his father. Okonkwo was clearly cut out for great things. He was still young, but he had won fame as the greatest wrestler in the nine villages. He was a wealthy farmer and had two barns full of yams and had just married his third wife. To crown it all, he had taken two titles and had shown incredible prowess in two intertribal wars. And so, although Okonkwo was still young, he was already one of the greatest men of his time. Age was respected among his people, but achievement was revered. As the elders said, if a child washed his hands, he could eat with kings. A Quanquo had clearly washed his hands, and so he ate with kings and elders, and that was how he came to look after the doomed lad who was sacrificed to the village of Umofia by their neighbours to avoid war and bloodshed. The ill-fated lad was called Thank you very much for that descriptive passage and the novel that reminds us of all of family, faith, free will, and above all, the preservation of heritage and culture. And now, to conclude our discussion, I would love to offer a quote by Friedrich von Schiller. It's not flesh and blood, but hurt, which makes us fathers and sons. Miss Natina, considering the books we've showcased today, do you find resonance with these quotes? It's an incredible, incredible quote and so true to the theme of this um, podcast, Father and Son. I'll read it again. It is not flesh and blood, but heart which makes us fathers and sons. The heart is everything in these three novels that we presented today. In the first novel, The Gospel of the Eels, there is much love between the father and son. And in the second novel, Horse, there is much conflict and argument, but physical and mental closeness. They are almost one, but with the son urgent to break away from his father. In the third novel, Things Fall Apart, there is immense aggression. The three novels include a good father, a father trying hard, and a son learning how hard it is to be a father. The classic novel that I selected, Go Tell It on the Mountain, has such an awful father, an abusive, hypocritical stepfather. All the novels have the structural narrative where the relationship between the father and the son is a formative element in the development of the novel's plot, and all the emotions stem from the heart, hearts experiencing joy, to hearts experiencing hate. Thanks for that superb quote, Tema. Thank you, and many thanks to our audience for listening to us today. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'm happy to in announce that the theme of the next episode will be Georgian poetry. So many books, so little time, so let's read and theme to connect three at the same time. Until our next Triple Treat book chat, then... Martina and Tamar wish you happy reading. Thank you.